Welcome back to Just Chat. And these are the videos we do on Thursday and Sunday evening just for our own amusement. So let me start off with, yes, yellow scarf. You don't see much of it on camera. Well, actually, you do. Um, this is one of the new ones I had to buy. I mean, I had to because I just don't have enough yellow scarves. So I'm doing it for Catherine. I can't even say that with a straight face. I have to send that woman a thank you note because people rarely give me a good excuse to buy new scarves, but by golly, she has. So, yellow for Catherine to wish her well. Uh, for those of you who follow the antics of Audie, he, there have been plenty of antics, but he's currently sleeping them off now. So, maybe he'll show up, maybe he won't, but like I say, we're in the other room. We are sleeping off last night's adventure. And as soon as I am through filming this, I got to go get the vacuum cleaner and clean up last night's adventure. He shredded a cardboard box. You wouldn't think a cat could do that. But there's nothing but tiny little pieces of former cardboard box all over the place. He's a naughty boy. So, we're going to take a quick break for the intro. We're going to come back and we're going to get right down to it. So let me start off by saying, no, the title of this video is absolutely not clickbait. Lady Colin Campbell's new book, and to be fair, I, I have only had a copy for, well, not even 24 hours. So I've only read about a quarter of it. And I can tell you right now, she started off with a bang. There was a genuine bombshell like right in the first chapter. The others, well, I'm only a quarter of the way through, so I can't speak for the whole book, but the other bombshells are more like landmines. Information that's already been there, that's already been available to us, that Lady Colin Campbell has been saying right along, and frankly, I believe her, things that she has been saying are true, and she's just reinforcing it and providing her sources this time. So maybe people will take these claims a little more seriously. Let's start off with the bombshell because I don't know about the rest of you, but I hate those videos when somebody says bombshell, but I'm not going to give it to you till the end. Okay, the first thing I have to do is in deference to what Lady C said herself, in the book. She cannot say for sure that we are talking about the same Doria Ragland, not Meg's mother, but she has uncovered information and she's put court docket numbers in the book that indicate a Doria Lois Ragland, not just Doria, Victoria Lois Ragland, uh, was convicted of fraud in California in uh, the period of time in which Doria was absent from Nutmeg's life. So, yeah, there you go. Furthermore, she also included uh, what she has called an offender ID number for a Doria Lois Ragland, meaning that we've got a Doria Ragland convicted of fraud in California, and the docket number, and we have a Doria Ragland with an inmate ID number, meaning that our Doria Ragland in question, who, again, 
in deference to Lady C's disclaimer, may not in fact be the very same Doria Lois Ragland that happens to be Nutmeg's mother. Did time for fraud. That is a bombshell. Now, rumors to this effect have been circulating for quite a long time, and I still have people asking me in the comments sections of my videos, can you dig up any information? And I tried, although I did not go through the California penal system, which maybe I should have, uh, but I tried to unearth any information about this through um, more publicly available sources, newspaper accounts, things like that. Could not. However, Quora has been saying this for years, an absolute years. People have been saying that the reason Doria was not present in Nutmeg's life when she was in junior high school, high school, even later in elementary school. So we're looking at a period of about 10 years when Doria was sort of missing in action. And people have been saying, no, she was in jail. Well, even though I could never unearth any proof of that, which is one of the reasons I would never go with that story, because I couldn't substantiate it. Boy, it sure looks like somebody has. And as I say, it's not just Doria Ragland. Doria Ragland is an unusual enough name to begin with, but when you throw in that middle name of Lois, L-O-Y-C-E, uh, which is a very unusual name. Doria Lois Raglan, well, you determine what you want from that because Lady C was very careful to give herself a little bit of legal maneuvering room in this. But I think we all know what's going on here. And as I say, you have the docket number, that's the number associated with with the case as it was brought through the court system, and then the offender ID number, which is the identification number that is assigned usually to inmates of the penal system. However, I do have to say, it might be assigned to people on probation, on certainly on parole, because they would have been inmates prior to the parole system. So who knows? Um, I do not know. These things vary state to state, I have to say that. So I do not know exactly how the California justice system works in this regard, but I would have to say, odds are, if you have an offender ID number, it's because you did time. There you go. Uh, and the charge was fraud. So I guess, assuming it was Nutmeg's mother, the apple does not fall far from the tree. What can you say? So, no question, that was a massive bombshell. Massive. And I think this is something that absolutely needs to be taken into consideration now that we are watching Nutmeg using her well, as she says, her quiet and classy mother, my mother's quiet and classy. Yeah, okay. As a, a public relations vehicle, having her mother show up with the Kardashian moms in photographs, with uh, Beyonce's mom, yes. I think this is probably enough to seriously scupper that play. So, Kudos to Lady C. She dug up information. Oh, by the way, she's not even American. She dug up information in our country that I couldn't find. And I imagine a lot of other researchers were looking for this and couldn't find it. So points to her for good research or maybe just getting lucky. I don't know how she came by this information, and she didn't say. It's possible she came up with it through her own research. It's also possible, because she's rather well-connected, that someone else came up with it and handed it to her. I don't know. 
Either way, it doesn't matter. She's putting it out there and it needs to be put out there. I think it's very unfortunate for our British friends who certainly saw uh, this woman brought before the Queen, photographed with the Queen, accepted by the Queen, who undoubtedly was unaware of this. So I don't know what to say. It's It looks like the scamming and the fraud sort of runs through the family. And I, oh, I should say though, someone goes to jail, serves their time, they should be able to go out into society after they have been released without a lot of ramifications. However, there are always some ramifications. Many times uh, when you have been convicted of a crime, this information will prevent you from having employment in certain sensitive areas. And let me give you an example. It surprised me to find that Doria was later employed as a social worker. And the reason for that is I was a social worker and I had to do criminal background checks. Now, in my case, I think I only had to do two over the course of my career, but that was a long time ago. Uh, I would imagine they're doing it more consistently these days. But if I had any kind of criminal conviction, I would not have been able to be employed in a position uh, of trust on behalf of the state. I understand that. It makes sense to me. It's not about continuing to penalize someone for a crime for which they have paid their debt to society. It's a matter of protecting a vulnerable population in the future. And yes, we should always defer uh, on the side of caution when we are dealing with vulnerable populations. So there you go. It's kind of covered all the bases. The other, uh, and I have at least two or three, but I, 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 hopefully I will get to two. The other ones, moving away from this. Uh, Lady C further stated, not with regard to Doria, we've moved on, that Diana was not concerned about Charles running off with Camilla. The famous Bashir interview. There were three of us in this marriage. Well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. I've said this before. Lady C's been saying this for many, many years. In fact, I think she might have said this back in the early 90s when she did her biography of Diana. I, I'm not sure about that, though. Uh, but she certainly has been saying this publicly for many years. Diana's nemesis was not Camilla. Diana believed that Charles was going to have her killed. I mean, this is how bad Diana's paranoia was. Have her killed so he could then go off and marry the nanny. That's how Diana described her. We'll get back to that in a second. Tiggy Leg Burke. Um, and they would get married. Diana would be bumped off and out of the picture. Okay. So Lady C does point out that calling Tiggy the nanny is really incorrect. She was certainly the governess. Lady C uses the French term. I do not use French terms when we have perfectly good English terms. So yes, the governess, not the nanny. And as Lady C rightly points out, a nanny is a servant. A governess is a much higher position. And governesses generally come from a much higher social strata because they were intended to 
not just change diapers and make beds, but to prepare the youngsters of the upper classes to go out into the world as productive adult members of the upper classes. So, yeah, they were not servants. And Tiki came from a pretty illustrious family, and uh, she was of the aristocracy. So, as was Diana, by the way, so it's not like she had a higher position in society than an earl's daughter. No, no, but they were definitely up there in the same strata. And Diana considered her to be the threat. She had come to believe that Charles was having an affair with Tiggy, and worse, at least in Diana's mind, uh, Tiggy had begun to alienate the affections of her children. Uh, William and Harry, when they were children, were very attached to Tiggy, uh, probably even more so after Diana died, and Tiggy was their emotional mainstay during that period. Because remember, they were both young when Diana died, and they were, they were cut adrift, both of them. Uh, losing a parent is a terrible thing, and Tiggy was a source of support for them. She was a counterpoint to Diana. Diana was, despite the fact that she was very much raised in that country aristocracy tradition, as she became an adult, and certainly once she was an adult and got a taste of you know, London and London's nightlife and diversions, she became very much a city girl. So even though when we see Diana as a young woman, she looks like just the picture of the country gentry wife. No, that wasn't her. It pretty much was Tiggy. Tiggy was outdoorsy and no nonsense and just uh, the embodiment of those values. And those values were very attractive to Charles. So and we can't forget that. Charles always preferred that sort of rural life, as, as we know even now when he retreats to Sandringham, to Highgrove, to, to his little piece of heaven in the country. So I've often speculated that one of the things that attracted him to Diana was that he bought into her appearance, you know, with the cardigans and kilts and, oh, this is a country girl, and kind of got a little shock when he found out that that just wasn't so. But Tiggy, yes. Was Tiggy a legitimate threat to Diana? No, because there was no affair going on. Uh, Tiggy was, in fact, the reason that the Queen eventually insisted that Charles and Diana divorce because things were brought to a head uh, with the Bashir interview in which Diana said there were three of us in this marriage. She never mentioned Camilla, and those of us who have seen the Bashir interview know this. How do we know we were talking about Tiggy? Because, and Lady C actually puts this in the book she quotes from testimony given at the inquest into Diana's death from people who said, yes, Diana believed this and gave this information freely to the courts. And keep in mind, Diana also produced interviews, well, I don't think Diana did this with the intention of producing interviews. Her speaking coach, her, she had a, a public speaking coach who recorded their sessions and Diana spoke very freely to him. I do not believe she ever did so with any notion that these recordings were going to become public, but because they were dealing with her speaking, she knew she was being recorded. That was one of the tools they would use in order to improve her public speaking. Was she prepared for the eventual publication of this? I don't think so. 
but they are out there. They have been published. And Diana did, in fact, believe it was Tiggy and said so to virtually anybody who would give her the time of day. So this is important because Camilla has been repeatedly accused of being the cause of the breakdown of this marriage, when in fact, no, no. Was she in the picture at this time? I do not know. I, I was not a fly on the wall in Charles's bedroom. She may have been, but that is not what Diana believed. She said repeatedly that Camilla was just the cover story, that the real affair was with Tiggy, and this did trouble her. And the reason why is because she would have perceived Tiggy as being a much more serious threat, a person from backgrounds similar to hers that would have made her an appropriate choice if Charles was in fact interested in marrying a second time, uh, and a woman who clearly had a temperament and interests that were consistent with what Charles was looking for. So, yeah, Camilla was probably not likely to be perceived as a threat by Diana. Tiggy, however, was. And as I say, this time around, because Lady C said this before, she, this is not new news, but she is quoting the sources this time, so people are going to be forced to take notice of this and accept the reality that Camilla did not have responsibility for the breakdown of that marriage. Diana was already suspicious, paranoid, um, accusing another woman of alienating the affection of her husband and her children and having affairs of her own. So Camilla's gotten a bad rap for a very long period of time. And let's hope this one, and I would call this a landmine, because it's been there, it's been buried. And yeah, let's dig it up and take a look at it. But let's hope this one is enough to get Camilla off the hook. Not in time to do her any good, but still, let's hope. Um, we've got time for at least one more. So this one, again, it's more of a landmine. It's always been there if we had been willing to see it. But Lady C really develops this. Harry, when he was a young princeling, was in the papers for all the wrong reasons. The Nazi uniform, the wild partying, he was, well, as he said himself in spare, he was known as Harry the Thicko. I, accurate, but it's not something you want to be known for in the media. And despite his unbelievable animosity toward the press. It was the press that rehabilitated his uh, reputation. And this started when he took his gap year, went off to Australia, then to Africa, then to Argentina, and eventually ended up in the military. The press shifted their focus and began portraying Harry in the media as, you know, the rough and tumble jackaroo when he was in Australia. They began highlighting his humanitarianism when he was in Africa. They began overtly making comparisons between Harry and Diana when he was in Africa. And they very graciously refrained from giving too much press to the fact that when he was in Argentina, he wasn't really working. He was just playing around. This was just fun in the sun and polo. He also very much got a pass from some of his later antics, you know, which was uh, things like Harry in Las Vegas, and we all remember that, or being seen around London with a drink in his hand, which is pretty much how he was seen around London. 
And then they began highlighting his military service in such a way as to make Harry appear to be the brave soldier anxious to do his duty, a war hero. And they very carefully failed to mention that he was really not seeing action. He was not on the front lines. So they framed this part of Harry's life in such a way as to make him very, very appealing to the British public while simultaneously holding back bits of information. Um, and for example, we know that when they did the random surprise drug testing, that Harry was routinely informed beforehand uh, so that he could sneak away and not have to be drug tested, which probably would have been embarrassing. But they were very careful to hold him up as a hero. And the press and their coverage of Harry in his early 20s, well, his 20s in general, like basically, well, what, his, his early 20s right through to his early 30s, the press coverage was so favorable that Harry in this period was the second most popular member of the royal family uh, coming in behind the queen. This is what the press did for Harry. And it was all press coverage. Because the fact is, if we, stick, if we pick apart what Harry was actually doing, you know, and I'm not going to give you my opinion. I'm going to give you the opinion of actual soldiers. He was playing dress up. He was just Bunker Harry. He had video game consoles, and that's what he was doing when he was over there. That is not the Harry that the UK tabloid press spoon-fed to the people for a decade. No, not even close. So what you have is, I don't want to say there's a disconnect here. He really did serve. He really was in the military. But was he a hero? No. Was he on the front lines? No. Was he in the middle of action? No, no. He was playing soldier. And that is according to the real soldiers who are actually out there doing the work. And we cannot discount their opinions. So when we start to hear about Harry's latest lawsuit against whatever newspaper he's targeting next, and how the press killed his mother, and the press are making a nightmare of his life, and he is not safe to even go back home, because the paparazzi follow him everywhere. He's very conveniently forgetting the fact that the height of his popularity in the UK was a direct result of a concerted effort on behalf of the UK press to show him in the most favorable light. Now, granted, they weren't necessarily doing this for Harry's benefit. They were doing this in order to put the best possible face on military engagements that the British people might not have found desirable in and of themselves. This was for the people of the UK perhaps more than for Harry, but the major beneficiary of this was Harry. So when he starts criticizing the media, he is truly biting the hand that feeds him. So those are three, again, the last two are sort of landmines. It's information that was always there. It's just that Lady C has brought it out in the case of Tiggy, she has offered concrete support of this. And in the case of what's going on with Harry's public relations during the early part of the 21st century, again, she's bringing it out so that we can see it. So I would say those two are sort of landmines. Used to be buried, 
the lady sees dug them up and she's thrown them out in such a way that we really just cannot deny it anymore. No one can look at this and say, well, that's not so. The bombshell, of course, is Doria. So people may have had their suspicions. Some people may have, in fact, known that it was true, but have been unable to prove it well. Boom. It's out there. So I think in terms of what's going on in the book, well, first of all, go buy the book. This is actually a good read. Um, and uh, for those of you who are aware of the fact that I have often said that the problem I have with much of what Lady C has written is that the quotes are not properly attributed. Well, this time they are. So I don't have any room to complain about this, but it's a good read. It's informative. Go get it. Um, and that's what I have for you today. We are going to take a look at a slideshow on the way out, and we will be back next week with more hopefully with more from Lady C's book, but with more of something or other. So we're going to take a look at a slideshow on the way out and have a terrific day. Thank mm -hmm. you.